Welcome everyone to our QUT panel presentation for World Mental Health Day, Mental Resilience in Tough Times. I'm Professor David Kavanagh and I'll be your facilitator today. First, Uncle Chegg will welcome us to country. QUT acknowledges the First Nations owners of the lands and where we gather today and pay our respects to the elders, laws, customs and creation spirits of this country. For thousands of years, the First Nations owners have gathered to share their knowledge and stories. We pay our respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and acknowledge the important role they play within our communities. We recognise their long and continuing connection to country, the lands, winds and waters throughout Australia. We recognise that these lands have always been places of teaching, researching and learning. Thank you. We also acknowledge today anyone who has challenges with their mental health and well-being who may be with us and anyone who is supporting uh, someone with such a challenge. Next we also have a, a brief video from Professor um, Lynn Griffiths, the Executive Director of the Institute of Health and Biomedical Innovation. Welcome to the QUT Real Health Public Lecture on Mental Resilience. I'm Professor Len Griffiths and I'm the Executive Director of IBI, the Institute of Health and Biomedical Innovation at QUT. And I'm really pleased to welcome you today to this lecture on mental resilience. It has been a tough year. We've had COVID-19, we've got a looming recession, potential unemployment and a lot of uncertainty. So it's really important to develop coping mechanisms. Today's World Mental Health Day and we want to help you understand mental health, including things like psychosocial and genetic factors involved, how the brain works, and what brain plasticity is. We want to help you with the tools to build resilience and to cope with stress. We've gathered together IBI researchers to help you understand mental health and to give you some insight into the research we do in this space. I hope you have a good World Mental Health Day and the virtual lecture will help build your skills and improve your resilience and your personal mental health. So today for this session, we're delighted to welcome Monique Murphy as our keynote speaker. Uh, before having a panel discussion with some of QUT's leading researchers in this field, uh, on, my, on my right, Associate Professor Divya Mehta, Professor Sel Selena Bartlett, Associate Professor Esben Strodel, Professor Ian Shockett and Dr. Sarah Hampton from the Gallipoli uh, Medical Research Foundation. Mental health is sometimes used incorrectly to mean mental disorder, but that's not what we're talking about today. Our focus in this session is deliberately on resilience and well-being, on recovery from difficult experiences, rather than on uh, symptoms or disorders. It doesn't ignore the problems that people face, but focuses on what we have on our strengths, what we can do, rather than what we've lost or can't do. Monique Murphy is a Paralympian who fell from a fifth floor balcony in 2014, resulting in amputation of her right leg below the knee. However, she jumped back into the pool the following year and accomplished her dream in 2016, winning a silver medal in the 400 meters freestyle at the Paralympic Games. During Monique's address, or any time later in the session, you can ask a question of her or other panellists by using the Q&A function below on your screen. We may not be able to answer all of your questions, but we'll discuss as many as we can later in the session. So, Monique, over to you. Hi. I want to begin by asking you to think back or think forward to your 20th birthday. I want you to think about what you were doing, where you were in your life, what things you were trying to accomplish, the friends that you had, and I want you to think about where your mental health was. I want you to think, were you even conscious of what your mental health was doing? Just before my 20th birthday, my mental health was definitely being tested. 
Only a few weeks before my birthday, I was involved in a very serious accident. I fell from a fifth floor balcony and woke up from hospital a week later from an induced coma to find that my right foot had been amputated, among many other injuries. Not only was I there in hospital with this now very broken body, but I had a huge decision to make. It was my choice, and my choice alone, whether I go for a further amputation. And I can tell you now, that was not something that was on my birthday list for turning 20. Being so young, I was so unsure about what was going on. And I could feel that from my parents as well. But I'm so lucky that they were there for me every step of the way. Because even though I wasn't too sure what was going on with my mental health, I just knew that it all really sucked. My parents knew that they needed to be there to support me because I couldn't possibly understand every little thing that was going on and make the right decisions all on my own. I remember having people from Limbs for Life Australia come and visit me, fellow amputees who would share their stories, helping me understand the decision that I was being forced to make. The words and their experience that they gave me meant more to me than any of the doctors that were in that hospital because these people had been in my shoes. They had faced similar trauma and similar circumstances and by sharing the experience, I suddenly didn't feel so alone. And when I decided to tell the doctors that I wanted to proceed with a further amputation and they standing there with their two good legs told me, yeah, we'll do the same thing, I told them to get out because I didn't want to hear it. It can be so lonely at times when our world turns upside down. But when we can find other people and we can open up and share our experiences, that loneliness starts to lessen and we feel like our burden is starting to lighten. I remember one amputee in particular named Mike Rolls and he was a bilateral below knee amputee. Now, my mum had told him that I was a keen swimmer as a child, and he used this information and talked to me about the idea of getting a prosthetic fin. He himself was a scuba diver, and he had these amazing prosthetic fins that he would use on both legs, and he said he could swim faster than his friends. I turned to my mum, huge smile, and said, I'm going to be a mermaid. And it was this really strange moment, because even though we were surrounded by so much tragedy at that point, we were laughing, and I was suddenly feeling hopeful for the future. Another moment like that came along when a friend sent me a video of bilateral amputee and Paralympic snowboarder, Amy Purdy. She was dancing in this video because she was a contestant on Dancing with the Stars. And I didn't even notice that she had two prosthetic legs. And in that moment, I thought, if she can dance like that on two legs, I'm going to be able to walk with one. I kept reading about this incredible woman and I learned that she could even adjust the height of her prosthetics depending on who she was dating. And I actually felt a bit jealous that she was able to do that. And again, I had to remind myself, I'm sitting here with half the challenge, yet I'm jealous of her. And I was jealous as well because of how happy she was and how incredible her life looked. But that gave me so much hope. And again, it reiterated the power of sharing our experiences. On the day that I had to sign those medical forms, giving the doctors permission to proceed with a further amputation, I didn't quite understand what I was doing. In my gut, I knew I was making the right decision. The doctors had told me how a below knee prosthetic would give me better mobility and a better quality of life than a partial foot prosthetic, which is what I was currently contemplating. In my gut, I knew it's what I wanted to do, but I definitely had a lot of blind faith that the rest of my life was going to turn out okay. My hospital-appointed psychologist made a point to be there on that day, and I didn't really understand the urgency of why this was so important. I've always been very proud of how independent and strong I am, and sometimes I use that a little bit too much and get myself into some pretty deep situations, like signing away a part of my body. She arrived just in the nick of time as the doctors were handing me the forms and the pen. She sat down and told me to take a breath. 
I was quite impatient. I knew that making this decision would bring me a step closer to the life I wanted to get back to living. I just wanted to get all of this operations and recovery out of the way so I could focus on moving forward. And as I signed my name, the weight of that decision really hit me. Yes, I was making a decision that was going to help me in the long run. But right there in that moment, I was signing away a part of my body, giving permission for strangers, regardless of if they were doctors, permission to take that part of my body away and leave me in even more of an uncertain situation than I was. They took the forms and the pen and they walked out of the room and my psych held my hand and told me it was okay to cry. And they did. I wasn't aware at that time that I needed to ask for help. And I'm so lucky that she did and that she was there. And it was experiences like that in hospital being guided by professionals that really started the conversation between me and my own parents. They told me that if I was to continue on with my studies, which were in social work at the time, that it was paramount that I find time each day to look after myself. The next few months were going to be solely centered around me. And in the wake of a tragedy and a trauma like that, you really do need to put all your effort into yourself. So not only was my mental health being tested, but so was my parents. It became pretty clear that those few hours a day that I needed to spend on myself were going to be spent in the pool. I'd grown up a very keen swimmer. And even though I had walked away from the sport, something about the pool would seem to call back to me. The day that I got my first prosthetic leg, my parents were in the room watching me take my first steps. They didn't actually have a choice because they missed my first steps when I was a baby. So I warned them I was only going to recreate this moment one more time and they better be there. The moment that might have overtaken that one was getting into the pool a few hours later. It was a small hydrotherapy pool and the physios covered me in pool noodles and floaties and I was pretty embarrassed. But I straight away had this sense of freedom in the water and so much more mobility that I'm still searching for on land. Being in the water made me feel happy. And it was probably right then that I decided this is where I needed to be every day. That has continued with me since that accident. And my parents have continued to support that decision as well. And I think it's turned out pretty well for them because two years later, they were able to fly to the Rio Paralympic Games and see me win a silver medal. I think dad and mum have since stopped complaining about those five, five o'clock starts growing up as a kid. The power of sharing our experiences is still something that sits with me and it's why I'm here today. I remember being in hospital and dad came in with all these books that he'd ordered online, written by other people who had had similar traumas in their life, most of them amputees. He came into the room holding up book after book going, this person lost two legs, this person only lost one. This woman talks about whether she wears her leg when she has sex or not. And my Catholic mother was sitting in the corner and I'm feeling a bit mortified, but I was also like, dad, give me that book right now. Because <laughs> there were so many questions that I wanted answered and some that I didn't even know I wanted answered. And I found them in the pages of those books and I've since found them reaching out to those authors. I found them sharing my experience now and really lifting a veil on the difficult times. Because even though at the time when I was in hospital, I felt like those bad days might never end, there was still laughter in there. And I owe a lot of that to my dad's very dorky sense of humor. But that laughter started to continue, it started to grow. And those bad days, while some are still do exist for me, they're not there every day and I've been able to bounce back in a way that I didn't think was possible. And it was because I took time to find what made me happy and what would continue to make me happy, even with all the ups and downs and obstacles that I faced. I would love to tell you that that accident is the only bad thing to ever happen to me and ever will. But I think 2020 is proof that that's not true. <laughs> Since that accident, I've also been diagnosed with endometriosis and adenomosis which are two really just really bitchy conditions that women have to face, unfortunately. But because of how open we were during the time of my initial accident, how we worked on our communication as a family, 
how we acknowledged our mental health and what was going to work for us moving forward. We were able to take on those other diagnoses and other challenges in a way we wouldn't have before. Having friends and family is absolutely vital. And when I stepped forward to receive that silver medal, I was flooded with this sense of independence because I'd been the one to go training every day. I'd been the one to wake up and decide not to stay in bed, to put on my prosthetic leg and get to that pool and find something that I could accomplish and be proud of. That moment was so fleeting, but so powerful. And it was fleeting because it was replaced by that sense of support, love and family. My mum, my dad, my brother and my stepmom were up in the stands. There were tears, there were smiles, but we'd been in it together. My extended family, being the Australian Paralympic team, were out in the audience calling out the cooey, so I knew they were there with me as well. We are not alone when it comes to mental health, and there is power in numbers. Because when we are brave enough to ask for help, that's when we feel our burden lighten just a little bit. And if you are struggling to find someone to ask for help, but you feel like you need a leg up, well, I'm happy to tell you that there are fantastic air, um, communities out there such as Lifeline. And I'm a proud Lifeline community custodian, and I have their number here today. And they always, 24 seven, will have trained volunteers ready to answer your call. Because it doesn't matter how lonely or how scared you may feel, there is someone out there who is going to help you. And it is absolutely incredible, looking back over my last seven years, how much a person can train and work and build themselves up and get stronger. I put just as much effort into my mental health training as I do my swimming training, because it's a skill that I've got to work on every single day so that I can get stronger and more resilient. So that the next time something like a global pandemic hits, I have an action plan and a roadmap on how I'm going to work through it. And I also know to look out for my friends and family who might need a little extra support as well. Thank you. Thank you, Monique, for that really inspiring start to our session today. I'm, I'm going to come back to you later. That's right. <laughs> but just before, before we go to the other panelists, um, let's actually look at the other side of, of that support. Um, there'll be people here in the, who are looking at this and saying, well, how can I give support to somebody who's going through a tough time? And you mentioned a, a number of things there, uh, sharing the laughter, the, the love, and so on. But you know, what advice would you give someone who's trying to give support to someone else? Yeah, I was lucky to have so much love and support. But there were also, being 19 years old, a number of friends and people who couldn't quite face coming to the hospital and being there for me. And a lot of friendships were lost, which was another side that I had to deal with, which was really really unfortunate to feel like something that I didn't ask for happened and was taking away a lot from my life. But I think when I look back, it's, it's more about the actions than the words. No, no one had the answers for me in those initial days and that was okay, but they were there. And it was the friends who would turn up to the hospital with food, because hospital food sucks, um, or you know, with some DVDs to watch or yeah. something to do. And we didn't have to talk about it because a lot of them didn't know what to say. When my grandma um, arrived in the hospital, she found out that I'd recently gotten a tattoo on my right ankle. And she said, I'm so sorry you've lost your leg, but I'm really glad the tattoo's gone. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not what you would think you'd want to say to a person facing that kind of situation, but it made us laugh. And it was the fact that she was there. So I like to think that actions speak louder than words. And if you are feeling a bit lost and you don't know how to help somebody, it's again, it's where charities like Lifeline come into play and you can send someone a link or you can be there and encourage them to make that call. And I think we've got to outsource our support because there's no one person who can be there for everything because yeah. it's going to drain on them otherwise. Thanks so much. So um, what I plan to do now is to ask each panelist to briefly introduce themselves and what they've found in their research. And I'm going to pick up on those themes as they do that um, before going to questions that you've entered. And please remember that you can ask your questions by typing them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'm going to indulge myself to kick it off 
and talk about myself briefly. Much of my clinical research over the last 40 years has been on the treatment of alcohol and other drug use and on other mental health issues that often accompany it and create some complexity. And this research has, pre has repeatedly shown that brief treatments can often work as, as well as longer ones if they focus on positive motivation. So I studied the nature of both motivation and temptation, found they involve the same psychological mechanisms, and a key is the use of mental imagery to build motivation and confidence and guide and maintain your efforts towards a goal. And some of our brief treatments as a result have used um, remote methods, um, even letters, apps, um, web programs. But a theme of all of this work has been on the strengths and resources that people already have and that they can use to get the life that they most want to have. So firstly then, on my right, to Associate Professor Divya Mehta. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Divya Mehta. I am a geneticist and a biostatistician uh, at the School of Psychology and Counseling and the Center for Genomics and Personalized Health at QUT. Um, so a major research question is, why do we all react and respond differently to stress. So my research focuses on understanding what are the individual genetic and environmental factors that drive our response to stress. So we inherit DNA from our parents, and this does not change during our lives. But what does change is the activity of our genes. And the activity of our genes, it can go up and down depending on our environment and different lifestyle factors. So things such as sleep, diet, social support, exercise, all of this can influence our gene activity via a process of epigenetics. Epi in Greek means on top. So epigenetic processes are chemical modifications of our DNA which change the activity and the function of our genes without changing the DNA code. Epigenetic processes occur throughout our life. A lot of research so far, including my own research, has focused on the negative outcomes of stress response and stress exposure, looking at post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, etc. Here at QUT, we have established and initiated novel projects aimed at getting a more holistic view of the biological response to stress. We want to understand positive responses and positive measures, things such as resilience, post-traumatic growth. We want to understand what are the environmental mediators and drivers of our response to stress. For example, our research has shown that exercise and social support is highly beneficial, and this can reduce, and in some cases, even reverse some of the negative gene activity that occurs due to stress exposure. So what's the take home message from my research? Well, we cannot change our DNA code, but if we can identify what the risk and protective environmental factors are, we could change that, and we could be the drivers of our own mental health. Thank you. Um, can I just take that up for a moment? Um, you know, I think we, we sometimes think about genetics as being fixed and, you know, therefore we're sort of stuck. <laughs> we, can't, we can't change that. And you're talking about things that you can change. Um, so uh, you'd mentioned uh, exercise, you mentioned social support. But what else can people do, do you think, that could change that, that could help them to deal with the challenges that their own genetics face, uh, uh, get them to face. Yeah, so I guess with, the, um, with epigenetics, I think there's the good news and the bad news. Uh, the bad news is that um, some of the epigenetic changes can be uh, transmitted from parents to their children, so that's the bad news. The good news, David, as you pointed out, there are a lot of different environmental factors. So simple lifestyle factors, if we can change our sleep habits, have better diet. Um, in our research, social support, and as Monique has pointed out, is so important. You know, having the right family and friends, you know, people, you know, anyone who supports you. This is really important, and this can really change the activity of our genes, and this in turn can impact our health. Um, so, of course, the DNA itself cannot be changed, but by changing the environment, we can change our gene activity and function. Thank you. Next, we have Professor Selena Bartlett. Um, hello, 
to uh, Mental Health Day. I hope you're having a lovely day. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to really thank Monique for sharing her story and her beautiful um, family support in the audience here. Um, so my journey started in a similar way, uh, Monique, believe it or not, my, my personal experience with my sister. And she lost all her friends also. And so I kind of went on a journey to understand how the brain works from my sister's experience in a mental health situation. After 30 years, I've discovered just what Monique presented to each of you here today, and that's the amazing capacity of the brain for change. And it all starts with putting on that leg in the morning. Each of us have the same capacity that Monique talked to today. The brain has an amazing strength that's hidden inside there, just waiting to be explored, and each of us have that capacity. And, what my, and that's kind of what my lab does. So I'm not going to talk about my lab. You can find out what I do. But thank you, Monique, that strength and resilience is inside each of you listening to this call. It's just working out what resonates for you. For Monique, it was the swimming pool. For other people, it's getting up and looking outside onto the sunshine, into the trees. For other people, it's connecting to people. But not everyone has those connections. But each of us can find that capacity inside us once we understand that the brain and how it works has that strength and resilience. Thank you for being here today, really appreciate it. Thank you, Selena. Uh, let's move straight to, um, to Associate Professor um, uh, um, Esben Stradle. Sorry, Esben, I almost forgot your name there. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, yeah, so um, my uh, primary area is research in clinical and health psychology, but over the last few years, I've been invited by colleagues and um, postgraduate students to be involved in research looking at the link between spirituality and mental health. And I think there's good reason for that. You know, the professions of psychology and psychiatry, they're really less than 200 years old, but people have been gaining strength and resilience from faith and uh, spirituality for thousands of years. So I think it's a topic that's worth putting under the scientific microscope, so to speak, and finding out, well, what is it about spirituality that can be strengthening and helpful emotionally to people uh, in a modern society? And if you look at the research into spirituality, you can think about it in terms of focused on three uh, different areas. One is looking at the sense of connectedness or relationship that people can have with a higher power that could be with a god or gods or in some cultures or religions it's with uh, deceased spirits of uh, or spirits of deceased ancestors or animism. Um, the other area of focus is looking at the beliefs that people have that are associated with that sense of connectedness. So beliefs about whether we lived before we came to this earth, why we're here, is there life after death and so forth, but also the positive virtues that may be important in trying to facilitate a sense of connectedness with a higher power. And then the third area is looking at the beliefs or the practices that people engage in in order to uh, facilitate a sense of connectedness. And by and large, the research suggests that it's more that sense of connectedness and the beliefs that people have that strengthen people's mental health. And I guess an example of that is uh, a research study I was involved in in uh, Pondicherry in India, where we looked at a large group of postgraduate university students and found that even after controlling for their relationships with friends, family, peers, and so forth, um, it was their sense of connectedness with um, God or gods, in this case, most of them were Hindu, uh, that really was strongly associated with their quality of life, whether their physical quality of life, their social quality of life, their, their emotional quality of life, and less to do with what they actually did, their, their uh, religious practices. It was that sense of personal relationship that was important. Um, and so that's what my area of research has been in, but in terms of the broad field, the shining light of uh, success in this research has been mindfulness. Mindfulness is a, a process where you focus your attention on something, could be anything, um, and as your mind starts to wander, you refocus it and you just observe and uh, uh, without judging or evaluating. And of course that uh, process comes from Buddhist uh, meditation. And up to just about 50 odd years ago, it was seen as a mystical, uh, spiritual practice, but there's been thousands and thousands of uh, scientific studies looking at it and it's now uh, mainstream practice within modern psychotherapy. And so that's just an example of how examinations of uh, uh, beliefs and practices within spirituality can really um, uh, be beneficial to mainstream society. Um, and that's uh, the area that I'm looking at. Thank you, Esben. And, um Selena, does, is this, does this uh, practice of mindfulness um, speak to some of the 
the work that you were talking about in terms yeah. of um, the brain Absolutely. mechanisms? Absolutely, it really does. Um, so mindfulness came out of meditation. They actually uh, scanned all the Buddhist monks' brains. It's the work of Richard Davidson's lab in America. And Sarah Laser actually was the one that invented mindfulness that came from meditation to turn it into a, from Eastern to Western. And that's how it's spread across Western culture now. So what they demonstrated from a neuroplasticity, strength and resilience uh, work, and you can see this, it's all published, and it speaks to what Monique is describing in her, what, what she did for herself is exactly the same process in terms of how the brain's working. They discovered for mindfulness and from meditation, the Buddhist monks had changed their insular cortex. They'd expanded the physical connections, which is what you're doing every day, Monique, when you put on that prosthetic. Well done, so proud of you. And you're helping so many people, thank you. Um, and then what they also showed with the Buddhists when they put them in the, lay, in the brain scanner, brain imaging, that, and they put off a, something that would trigger their fear center, which as we know sits in the limbic amygdala part of the brain, they didn't have any reaction. They'd retrained their amygdala and expanded their prefrontal cortex. So they now had top-down control over those fear circuits in the brain. Amazing. Yeah. And I mean, we only knew that, we've only seen that, David, as you know, in your mm. work, only in the last 10 years that we've been able to show this, pull it out and show it. And, and, and that's the beauty. The Buddhists discovered this thousands of years ago and the neuroscientists are only catching up now. But in terms of how we can help our society understand how the brain works, it's only really recent. And so we're still catching up. And the Buddhists got it, <laughs> but now it's good to know that it's also that you can take a really deep breath, put on your prosthetic, and train your amygdala and strengthen your prefrontal cortex. And that's where we're moving now um, in terms of the new directions for brain health, mental health, strength, which is what we're here for today, is about strength and resilience. And the brain has a massive capacity for that when we get to see it. So it's just, everything's kind of merging together and it's wonderful to see. Thank you. Um, moving next to um, Professor Ian Shockett. Thank you, David. Yes, it's um, very delighted to be here. It's a, a real uh, privilege to be part of this panel and, uh, and a great privilege, of course, to have heard your story, Monique. Many thank you for that. Your story contains so many remarkable elements of resilience and, and uh, you know, uh, the, the, the messages that you shared, I think, are, are really uh, exceptional. Um, so for 20 years and more, I've been researching this uh, concept of, of resilience and particularly developing resilience interventions to promote positive mental health and well-being. Um, our first uh, uh, aspect of our resilience interventions has been to develop a program for adolescents, which is our flagship program called the Resourceful Adolescent Program, which has been implemented widely throughout Australia and, um, and internationally and then moved on to developing resilience interventions and researching their effectiveness for people at particularly high risk uh, uh, populations, such as police officers, mental health nurses, autistic adolescents, or indigenous Australians. And so I guess the first question is, what is resilience? And resilience is really a process. It's a process that we've um, all been called on to use in our lives and nationally and internationally. Right now, we, uh, as, a, as a world, we've been called on to uh, exercise this resilience process. And this process is the ability to adapt or bounce back in the face of stress and adversity. And um, resilience was being researched a, a number of decades ago when they thought that it was just something that only a few people had. But then they discovered that, in fact, that's not the case, that resilience resides in all of us. And somebody termed this coin the ordinary magic of resilience, just to get across this point that we really all have that capacity for resilience, and we all draw on this resilience capacity on a day-to-day -day basis. And the work that we've been doing is to try and harness those factors, those protective factors, and to put them into our interventions, which are implemented in schools and communities and elsewhere. And as part of that research, what we've also done is to look at what are the factors that promote positive mental health and well-being. And a particular focus of our research has been to look at this concept of connectedness and the sense of belonging, starting with examining 
for adolescents, their sense of school connectedness, their belonging at school and their general belonging. For adults, we've looked at workplace connectedness and, and, and general belonging. And what we've discovered for, with this research, which was really, the, the, um, uh, really interesting for us, was just how strongly your sense of belonging associated with your mental health and well-being. I think Monique touched off on many of these points in your, in your talk today. And so we were really struck at the, that, that these factors, like the sense of belonging and connectedness for adolescents at school, for example, was by far the single biggest protective factor for their sense of belonging and well-being. So the work we've been done is to try and harness these in our resilience interventions. Thank you. Uh, now, both, both Ian and um, Espen have talked about connectedness, and I'd like to ask you both, what is it about that connection that you think is so important? What, what's the mechanism that's actually making this work? We'll start with Espen. What's your thought about that? Well, the research that uh, we've done uh, looked at the link between uh, a sense of connectedness uh, with God and uh, quality of life, and the mediating relationship we looked at was uh, meaning and sense of purpose. That having a sense of connected with a higher being uh, seems to increase people's sense of meaning and purpose with life, um, and also an increase in sense of self-worth as they feel that they are living consistent with that, and that seems then to be uh, tied in with a greater sense of quality of life and, and reduced mental health problems. Mm. Um, and we know that, that, that meaning and purpose are key aspects of well-being. Mm. Um, yeah, um, Ian. <coughs> Thank you, David. Yes, yeah, so, you know, I think we all wake up every day scanning our environment for cues of whether we're being included and valued. And so we all need to have a sense of feeling valued and included. Uh, those are the key components in terms of the sense of belonging, a feeling of being valued by the group that you're with and included in that group. Interestingly enough, the notion of being a valued and included person you know, forms the acronym VIP, and I think that's really how we should think about our concept of, of connectedness. And so that anything that uh, caregivers or people around can do to help somebody feel valued and included uh, is important, and we can talk about that some other time, yeah, if we've got the time today. Yep. Thank you, Ian. And uh, lastly, we have Dr. Sarah Hampton. Sarah. Thank you, David. Hi, my name is Dr. Sarah Hampton. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist and research officer at the Gallipoli Medical Research Foundation. Um, Gallipoli Medical Research Foundation is a small medical research institute with about 45 staff working in the areas of clinical medical trials, veteran mental health, um, liver research and respiratory research. So I work in the veteran mental health team and a primary area of focus for us at the moment is veteran reintegration. So I'll touch on a couple of findings from some of our recent research, which I think does tie in well with our discussion on resilience today. So a little bit of background first. Um, all service members at some point in their military career will be faced with the transition from military to civilian life. And at the moment, the research is saying that almost half of those that transition will have a diagnosable mental health condition in the 12 months after the transition. Um, psychologists working with veterans on the ground are also reporting that um, many of the veterans they are working with are really, really struggling with this adjustment from military to civilian life. Whereas there were some others that seemed to struggle, uh, seem not to struggle at all. So this led the team at Gallipoli to investigate, well, what factors are important for a successful transition from military to civilian life? So the first phase of the research involved 180 hours of interviews with 60 recently discharged veterans, 20 partners and spouses, and 20 health professionals. And all of these interviews were analysed and a few interesting findings emerged um, in the areas of social connections, um, purpose and meaning, help seeking and beliefs. So firstly, social connections. So it's been mentioned quite a few times on the panel already and Monique mentioned it in her um, talk on how important that was for her. Um, but we found that the veterans who had strong, healthy social connections outside of the military 
um, had better transition experiences. And this is in line with decades of research of what we know about social connections and its, important for, in its importance for mental health. It's got links to lower levels of depression and anxiety, higher levels of self-esteem and reduced risk for suicide. Secondly, the, um, a second finding that we found related to purpose and meaning. So veterans who were able to establish a sense of purpose and meaning outside of the military had better adjustment experiences. Um, and this is consistent with what we know about purpose and meaning and its importance um, to give us perseverance um, and hope in the face of adversity um, to help us keep going through the, the tough times because we've got something to keep going for. The third point related to help seeking. So we found that um, the veterans who were more open and willing to seek help for their mental health when they needed it um, had better adjustment experiences. Um, and this is consistent with what we know about the many benefits of help seeking. Um, and Monique mentioned it as well in her, her talk about the importance of seeking help and accepting help, um, such as feeling less stressed and less isolated through sharing your feelings, um, having that, light, that burden lightened through talking with somebody um, and just gaining perspective as well. And fourthly, we found um, that beliefs were very important. So the veterans who had unhelpful or negative beliefs about civilians or civilian life um, tended to have more negative interactions with civilians and tended to avoid socialising with civilians, which was associated with a poorer adjustment. Um, and that's consistent with what we know about um, the importance of our thoughts and beliefs um, and how powerful they are really in um, influencing how we feel and um, interact with others. So yeah, I'm sure some of those things will be touched on throughout our our discussion this morning. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, this issue of transitions, I mean, I think many of us have been facing transitions this year, of course, with, with the circumstances that we've been following, but um, let, let's actually explore just for a few minutes across the whole panel what, what advice we could give to someone who's facing a, a, a significant transition. Um, one of the questions, Monique, that came up was relating to transitions from being a uh, a representative sports person to uh, what happens after that finishes. Um, uh, I'll get you to think about that for a moment. We'll come to you in a second. But have you got advice, uh, Sarah, for, for somebody who's facing a significant transition in their life? It might be a major change in their uh, occupation or other sort of context that they're having to deal with now. Yeah, I think with any major transition, it requires some serious thought about how to navigate that transition. Um, the social connectedness, obviously, um, if all of our connections are embedded in that one area, um, it's about trying to figure out how we can create connections elsewhere. Um, can we um, invest in some relationships outside of that workplace, for example, or find a new hobby, or um, find a way to start building relationships um, in multiple areas of your life. So there's not that extreme sense of loss once that transition takes place. Um, and the similar themes of purpose and identity, um, you know, sometimes our purpose and identity is really wrapped up in um, that particular workplace or sport or um, whatever it may be. And so um, as you've approach that transition, it may be about thinking, how can I establish a sense of purpose um, in another area? Is there um, you know, some relationships I can invest in or volunteering I could do? Or is there another hobby or interest I can um, take up and pursue? Um, and who, who, who else am I apart from this, this employee or um, sportsman or, or whatever it might be. So asking some of those questions and starting to pursue some other avenues outside of that workplace. Can I go to uh, Monique and that specific question about what happens when you, when people are, uh, we, we know several, <laughs> several well-known people have had real struggles with this. What advice would you, would you have to someone who's facing this kind of issue? So for, for me, myself, having stopped swimming before my accident, I went through a bit of that process then. I wasn't an elite athlete, but it was about 
finding, you know, what do I want to study at uni? Where do I want to go? Who do I want to be? So then finding myself back in the swimming world and at a much higher level now, I feel quite reassured that I have been out on my own outside of that swimming world and um, I can go back to it. I am someone separate from the athlete as well. I think it's about not putting any deadlines on the transition process so that it doesn't have to be, you know, finished or you have to be at a certain destination by a certain point because it can take a long time. I know the first time I stopped swimming, it took a very long time for me to, you know, accept that I couldn't tell people, oh, I've been up at five o'clock this morning, so I get to go back to bed or I get to do this. You've got to let go of a lot of those excuses because you're transitioning into a different kind of, kind of life. But I've always been very aware while I've been swimming on the team for the last five years that I need to keep some sort of study going so that I'm sort of keeping a foot in the door to other pathways. Um, that's also because of the, the lack of funding as a para, unfortunately. We do um, find that we do have to go out and try to find other sources of income, which does keep us a bit more engaged with other options as well. And I think as well, when I do come to that point where I leave swimming, it's not about being defined as an athlete. It's about looking at my time as an athlete as building me to who I am. It's not, that's not who I am in com completion. It's just a part that will set me up to be able to go further in whatever I do decide to do next. Thank you. Could I ask if anybody else would like to add something to, to those? Ian, you, you look like you've got something. <coughs> well, I, like I have, but in a sense, uh, you know, what I've written is, is uh, you know, meaningless compared to the story, I think, that Monique has told. But uh, uh, because, I mean, that's a really great example of, of you know, managing that transition. And, uh, you know, it captures just so many important elements. And, um, and part of it, of course, is, you know, recognizing the loss, you know, and to, and to have that recognized and understood by people that are meaningful in understanding that. You spoke about, you know, your reaction that you needed people that were really there that understood that and could, could be there for you in relation to that. So recognizing the loss and then the process of looking for the gain, if you like, within that, which is an incredible journey really to, to, to undertake. And the social support that you drew on to, to, you know, to, to, arrive at, uh, to arrive at that. The humor that you, you know, that, that, you know, clearly that we saw today and, and has been an important part of your life. And, and, and with all of that then, is maintaining that, that sense of belonging and the sense of accomplishment and purpose. And, and, and that's been the, the, the process that, yeah. You want to say, yeah, please. Um, my focus is neuroscience perspective <laughs> It'd here. It'd be great if you would, um, Celine. I call it path A versus path B. Um, and I'll just use two stories. Monique's first. She made a very clear decision. It was a very personal choice to take path A. It's the path of least resistance. It's, it's, it's the path of the most resistance, it's the most difficult path to take, that is to do something going forward. And this is not to dismiss any trauma or anything that's happened. It's a brain thing. I'm just taking the brain perspective. Um, and so while you're doing that, you're actually forging new pathways inside the brain. Um, so a second example, I could use my own personal story, but I'm not going to. I've got a friend, a, a, do a knock came on her door. It was a policeman that just arrived and she knew her son had just died. And he said to her, your son, so he fell off a cliff in California. And she made a choice in that moment to live or die. And she said, I'm going to live. And so by making that personal decision, like you did, is from a brain perspective, because the brain's an amazing machine, it starts to then set up this machinery to go and look for support by making that personal decision. And I know it's a difficult decision to make in these horrible moments. But when you do that um, and you understand how the brain works, it then starts to pull in all of these things that then support your journey forward in this really difficult pathway. The opposite pathway is the path of the least resistance and it's the one the brain really loves because it saves a lot of energy. And it just sits you there and it just doesn't let you move. And it's like got a lot of biochemistry around that. And I'm not trying to take it away from anyone suffering that's listening but just to let you know, there are two pathways um, and, and we can talk a lot about the science, but we don't have time today. But I just want to let you know, I call it, for me, it's getting up and taking path A every morning 
because I've had my own personal journeys too and I've learned a lot about the brain now. And thank you for Monique for taking that path eh, and showing other people that have got a brain that's really plastic at your age um, to, to how to do that. Can and they, and oh. we need people like you doing that to show um, them. When, so it wasn't, it was almost not going to be my decision. So the doctor initially, like I was in a coma, he wanted to amputate below the knee straight away. And it was my mum who said, no, I want that to be her decision. So really, it, like, if the doctor had made that decision for me, would that have been more difficult for me then moving forward? So yeah. even though I had to make that horrible decision at that time, that it sounds like what you're saying, that that really helps set me up for oh, moving forward. There's that forward. decision. Also, the decision of you to go back into the swimming pool is what yeah. I'm implying is because mm. you, uh, it, little things like that is like you've made a decision about a big vision in your life. Yeah. Because our lives, each of us here in this room and on the line, it's very short, actually. Mm. If you take a big lens in the history of time, we're here for a very brief time. Yeah. And so, yes, we can get stuck in a lot of the things that most of us inherited without even knowing what we inherited. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea of neuroplasticity and this mental strength and resilience, each of us are here to talk about epigenetically, um, uh, all of these other mechanisms around connection and all of these things like perspective taking all rely on us retraining the brain in some yeah. perspective. You know? So what you're doing is doing that on a daily basis and we talk about connection, but that's mirror neurons, people are copying you and you know, things yeah. like that. So you're sending out a message to each of us here, but also around the world yeah. of how to do it, you know. And that also, what you've been talking about also raises the, the whole issue of, of agency and how important mm -hmm. that is. Um, a, a sense of, of making decisions yeah. yourself and being and in control wanted, of your life. That's what mum wanted me to do. She, she wanted me to have some sense of control in that situation when so many decisions weren't being made. I woke up and a lot of surgeries had already been done and a lot of surgeries had been finished. So yeah, she just wanted to, me to have some sort of control. At the time I was like, I don't want to make this decision. But having that agency, yeah, clearly set me up to be able to continue to, to do that. Now at, at the moment, um, the elephant in the room is of course COVID. Um, and a lot of our agency has been taken away from us, um, mm. you know, in terms of government restrictions and so on. So, and and it's it's very easy then to get caught up in the negativity, right? You you uh, you have a whole lot of things which are which are there, and some of the questions that have already come into us have been around these these really quite significant worries and and issues that people are dealing with. So I'm going to go along the panel and, and see if there is something that, that you could say that people would help in, um, in addressing this lack of control that you've got and the, the overwhelming nature of things that some people are dealing with. Shall we start with Divya? Yeah, I think, um, of course, the COVID-19 has really highlighted that mental health is so multi-layered. And um, I guess from the genetics perspective, as I mentioned, um, one thing that it has shown is how all of us have reacted and responded so differently. So almost everyone has been affected in some or the other way, but the reactions and the, you know, the outcomes have been different, again, showing differences and individual differences. And these differences, again, are due to not just our genes, but you know, our social support, um, you know, our ability and our want and need to build the resilience, be resilient. Um, you know, what factors do we have? Do we have family? Do we have friends? Um, do we have communities that are supportive of us at this time? So again, I think from the genetics perspective um, and from the environmental perspective, this again clearly shows that we need to deal with mental health at a more broader level, um, not just the individual level, because as an individual, um, you know, we can you know, tackle mental health in a particular way, but you know, we need the family, the society, and the community as a whole to deal with it. Selena, you've got something that you'd like to add? Uh, I think, well, COVID-19 is an amplifier to the way the brain processes stress. So, um, and I knew this going into March, so I started creating videos because unprece unprecedented levels of stress require unprecedented levels of training every day. 
um, in terms of like the things you've got to do every day for your mental health or what I like to call it brain health is you need to do it at 10x what you were doing before. So if you're walking for 15 minutes before, you should really now be walking for 30 minutes out in the nature because, because the way the brain processes all this information, it takes in negative information at a much greater rate than positive. It's just how it's wired over you know, evolution. And so I would say that why we're here today and out there are now um, a, pub a paper just got published. We now know that there's a 55 to 72 percent increase in Australia in even without a mental health diagnosis of people reporting a mental health advent or how they're feeling in their life. So my, my take home to the people listening is that you need to be, it's not just about the individual, it's about everyone, but in terms of what you can do for yourself right now is to get to understand that you need to be doing more than you thought you'd need to be doing, whether it's meditation, mindfulness, yoga, exercise, eating well. Um, these things really, really matter because our country has never seen anything like this before. And we on this panel know that by mid-2021 to 2022, we're facing something our country can't actually have enough resources to handle. So what we're doing today is really important and we need to keep getting these brain health conversations going. So it's not mental health necessarily, it's also about all families dis discussing the beauty of the brain, not just its weaknesses, but its strengths so we can all have everyone across the society in Australia particularly talking like this in a really good way. Little things that people can do that really will help them on a daily basis. Esben. Yeah, for, from a spiritual perspective, remember there's these three areas of sense of connectedness with, with a God, with your beliefs about and their behaviours. I think it's particularly the, the uh, connectedness and beliefs that are important in times like this. So in times of crises, often uh, many people do increase their sense of searching to try and feel a sense of connectedness with a higher being and it gives a sense of safety and security. Uh, but also in terms of the beliefs that if you have a well um, articulated and clear sense of meaning and purpose to life, then no matter as you go through transitions or your uh, individual life circumstances changes, as you link that back to this higher order belief system, uh, it gives you a sense of control and perspective um, in times of turbulence. And so that sense of meaning then uh, can be really important in helping people through a process of crisis. But the other point then I, I wanted to link in was you talked about agency before. And there has been uh, good research then showing that the more that you align your sense of agency, you make your choices in align with your underlying values, um, the, the, the better your sense of self-worth, the greater you feel about it. And there's even a, a type of therapy called acceptance and commitment therapy, where a key part of it is helping people to identify what their values are and align them to that. And so from a spiritual perspective then, you know, uh, in times of crisis about helping people uh, explore that sense of connectedness with a high being, but also then explore their sense of purpose, their meaning in life and their values, and then trying to live in accordance with that. Thank you. Um, there's a specific question that came in for you, Monique. Um, what motivated you to go forward rather than feel sorry for yourself? And it's relevant, I think, in this context. Yes. Um, so when I first woke up in hospital, obviously I had the discussion with my parents on whether we look for answers to find out what happened that night, because not only do I not remember, but nobody saw what happened. And it is suspected my drink was spiked, but there, is, there were no blood alcohol tests or drug tests done. So there was a huge question mark there. But I knew that by searching for those answers, nothing was going to change. Mm. And having suffering an injury like an amputation, it is so, it's so clear and in your face, my leg is just not there. So I knew that it was not going to grow back and it was not going to come back if I was to spend all that time searching for answers that really weren't going to change anything. But what I could do is focus on myself and put that energy into doing the physio exercises, doing the rehab and moving forward and controlling what I could control. And even in a world with COVID, there are still elements that we can control. They're not as big, but they are still there. And in sport, we call them the one percenters. And they're the one percenters that get you on to that wall before the next person. Yeah. So it's, it's focusing on those little things and you know, little by little, a little becomes a lot. So it's tedious and it's exhausting. And talking about transition before, I'm talking from a perspective when you have the agency to make that transition, whereas COVID has, you know, it's taken the gains from a lot of athletes and it's taken a lot of jobs from a lot of people. So all of a sudden 
you're being forced to transition or forced to stay still when you didn't want to make that choice and that makes it a lot more difficult for sure. Yeah. Ian. <clears throat> so I guess we're still on the issue of agency and... and, and well, particularly and the COVID in the context of, of COVID, of COVID. Yeah. Mm. And I think that's a, you know, it's interesting. Yes, we have had a lot of agency taken away from us, but as a, as a, as, as a human species, we're always striving to find some form of agency, even in the context of, our, of less control than we had in our life. And I think we've all seen how this has actually worked. Um, uh, for, for us all, uh, you know, we, we've all had to make some incredible adjustments. And um, so what helps a little bit, I guess, in this concept, uh, you know how I mentioned that a sense of belonging was the most important variable in, 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 in mental health? Recent research that we've done has come up with the fact that probably what's just underneath that is a sense of accomplishment. And so that anything that we can do in this particular context that can also bolster our sense of accomplishment. And I think all of us in the COVID lockdown have tried to find ways to improve our, our sense of accomplishment. So, you know, whether I'm, I, I'm trying to teach myself Spanish or, uh, or, or, or something like, like that in that context, uh, you know, uh, somebody in our family has gone into baking. So, you know, hence I've all, you know, put on extra 20 kilos, if you like, in the context of, <laughs> of COVID. Uh, I used to be skinny before this. No, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's not true. But um, so, so anything that sort of provides that sort of sense of accomplishment is, is important. So if you can, you know, be, be an agent in the things that you do have control of, ensure that you continue with your belonging and your connectedness and reaching out as much as you can and then focusing on what you can do to give you a sense of accomplishment i think those are the sort of the key components thanks ian and sarah yeah i totally agree i think covid has caused significant changes in the way that we live and work and socialize and these changes have occurred mainly outside of our control so there is that issue of um, there's a lot of things that we don't have control of but there's also a lot of things that we do have control of so it's about um, shifting focus from what we don't have control of to what we do have control of because if we're always thinking and talking and watching constant news coverage um, for example um, we can feel very easily a sense of helplessness um, and despair and um, all of that uncertainty and fear and anxiety because uh, we feel that there's nothing that we can do. But the truth is there is a lot that we can do um, and it's about identifying the things that we do have control of. So for example, with the news coverage, um, having some boundaries around how much news coverage um, of the coronavirus we do, do allow ourselves to watch. Um, having some boundaries around how um, much we talk to people about the coronavirus and if it's something that's always coming up and it's making you feel um, stressed or anxious it might be about being assertive and um, saying you know do you mind if we change the subject um, and just talk about something else today um, so there's a couple of examples and um, also for uh, from a physical point of view, we know that physical and mental health are very, very closely connected. So taking ownership over your physical health um, can really, really help with um, reducing feelings of anxiety. For example, exercise, um, getting out into the sunshine and doing some aerobic sort of exercise like walking or swimming, cycling, um, has been found to be very effective in metabolizing stress hormones um, like adrenaline and cortisol. Um, and the vitamin D of the sun is really important too with um, kind of promoting restful sleep and boosting mood and um, things like that. So um, being, being mindful over what we think as well. We have a lot of control over our thoughts and beliefs um, and focusing on the facts rather than the fear and the hype and the media sens say, sensationalism um, can really help too. So identifying the things that you do have control of and focusing on that. Thank you. And, you know, as I said earlier, I've been working on, on uh, mm. assisting people who often have very complex problems in their lives. One of the things that, that has come out of that is that it's really important to identify one thing that you can start with. <laughs> you know, I think when you've got an overwhelming lot of things happening, you're like, just where do I start? So find something that you can work on, and ideally something which is going to have an impact on multiple areas in your life. 
And uh, one of the things that we know about, about depression is that one of the simplest and fastest ways to deal with feeling low picks up on the things that people have been saying. It is to, do, to actually look at something that you can achieve today and pay attention to what you have achieved today. Look for something that you can do that you will get pleasure from today that will help to lift your mood and give you strength to, to be able to deal with these multiple things. So if there's something that you take away from today, please, please do take that away. Um, look, there's been a number of things that have come out in, in the questions that came before this session that were, were sent in. Um, can, I, can I actually pick up on, on one thing here that was, uh, really struck me? Uh, it's, it's, it's from Ben, who's um, been stressed and anxious with lots of things. Um, and he's been trying to do some of the things that the panel's been saying. So he's been working out at the gym for relief, and it, does, it doesn't seem to help, um, though. Um, sometimes he has uh, moments of happiness, but then it turns into depression and gets this cycle. So would someone like to, to suggest some ways forward for, we, we won't have the solution for Ben, but <laughs> some ways forward of things that Ben could use. Who wants to start? Yes, Celine? Um, so from a, from a neuroscience perspective, what we now know is that the um, causes of this, uh, what ben, I, I read that one too, and I think it's really important because it's, we, we now know university students are suffering big time and 19 to 25 year olds. So between the ages of 19 and 25, the front part of the brain's still developing. And that's where cognition sits. Your executive function sits. That's where impulse control to short-term decision-making to long-term goal planning sit. We now know that the blood flow in that part of the brain is severely impacted by stress. And not just, so COVID-19 is amplifying that. So it's making us have foggy brains and making us feel more reactionary to things around us, which is what we're all talking about, scrolling. Like, what are they calling it? Doom scrolling, our feeds. Um, so so from, if Ben's listening, um, I really highly recommend that you reach out to different people and there, there are different strategies that you can now use that implement the principles of neuroplasticity that actually improve cognition. cognition. That's that part of the brain that's being severely impacted by stress. So we can now neurologically improve brain function that improves cognition, that allows us to have greater um, brain health and resilience, for example. We now know that we didn't know that before, so that's just happened in the last 10 years. So when I read that, that's my immediate reaction to that. So understand you're not born a blank slate, the brain develops over a long period of time and you're inheriting different parts of your brain from different parts of your family. So sometimes we don't even know what we, why we're doing what we're doing. But underlying depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar, addiction, we now know the causes started from early life experiences and the way they've impacted brain development and architecture. So when I read that, that my first thought was it's around executive function. So if you can actually reach out to people that have experience in this field, where you can actually um, rebuild the cognition part of the brain um, and that'll allow you to have more impulse control, which will which allow you to have happiness maybe a little bit longer before it turns into sadness from a rational human development brain perspective. Someone else want to comment on this cycling problem where you know, there's moments of happiness, but you go back down again. <coughs> I suppose um, just a, 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 a couple of comments, and I'm very grateful for that question um, you know, coming, coming, coming through. I mean, I think uh, important to recognise that that you know people uh, have uh, ep uh, you know episodes of depression and anxiety, and often what happens is that people become depressed about being depressed, if you like, or anxious about being anxious, and uh, and and so to recognise that uh, yes, you know, you do cycle in and out of uh, out of that, and and that you will uh, have moments of of cycling in and out, and um, and that you have conditions that are. Are, are common and, and treatable and, and, and that there's help out there and that you need to not think that you need to manage that on your own. The other thing to keep in mind is that even when we are experiencing mental health problems, it doesn't mean that we can't experience moments of, of well-being. And in fact, these two variables are, are, are not the same. So mental health and well-being are not considered just to be opposites of one spectrum. 
that you can, they, they have a, this, this notion called the two continuum model, that you're capable of experiencing mental health difficulties and at the same time can still have the capacity to experience well-being and moments of, of thriving and to keep that in mind. And indeed purpose. And you know, indeed I think purpose, and yeah. Really quite critical. Uh, Dan, um, I can add to that too then. So yeah. I think uh, that, that uh, point I highlights a, a, a some, something important. I think that people are different and you know, often we think about uh, treatment plans in terms of bio, psychosocial and I would add spiritual um, factors and that for different people sometimes depression could be largely a biological factor, sometimes it's uh, psychological factors, social factors or, or spiritual factors and so part of then is trying to look through what are the underlying uh, factors in all those areas but often I think uh, a good way of thinking about um, depression and anxiety and so forth. It's not just that this, these are symptoms, but that they are information that uh, an underlying emotional need is not being met. Uh, and then trying to think through, rather than strategies trying to reduce the symptoms, trying to think through well, what is the underlying emotional need that's not being met here. And I think uh, no, we all have different emotional needs, and so it's hard to work what out is for Ben in this instance. But you know, often it's uh, issues of safety and security, or uh, needs for achievement, as uh, Ian was writing to, or belongingness and so forth. And so um, that would be, I think, something important for Ben to be exploring is, well, what's the uh, underlying emotional need that might not be met at the moment for, for whatever reason? And then how this, what can I do about it? And I guess from a spiritual perspective then is often then uh, people do have underlying needs for either connectedness with other people or, or God, but also uh, a sense of purpose and meaning and so forth. Um, and there, there were things exploring about and how that sort of fits in with uh, uh, those symptoms of depression. Yeah, uh, there were some broader things that came through to me about this and, and it picks up on, on what Monique said and what several other people have said that recovery, even from feeling really low, recovery or uh, being able to get through a loss or a difficult experience is not, is not a single line, it's, it's, it's actually going up and down. But it's important to be able to pick up the fact that you are actually going on a a rising trajectory and sometimes uh, getting understanding of what it is that brings you down, what brings you up, see if you could do some more of those things that bring you up along that trajectory, um, but noting that in fact the direction is up even when sometimes it feels like you're dropping back. Um, yeah, look, I wonder if I could pick up one last question before we finish, and it's going to have to be brief, but I'm, I'm aware of the fact that there are a number of th people here um, a, live with this, uh, who are coming from other countries, other cultures, perhaps even in Australia, are in a context where there isn't a lot of understanding of mental health uh, issues or perhaps um, a different understanding of mental health issues. Um, I'm wondering, Ian, could you make a brief comment about, about that kind of issue? <coughs> yeah, thank you, David. I, I mean, I, I think in some ways, you know, what we've been saying before is uh, still, still applies, if you like, in the sense that uh, most important is to try and, and um, create a sense of empathic milieu around you, to have people that care for you, that understand you, and that make you feel understood. I think that that feeling of being understood is, is you know, um, vitally important. Um, so, and, and, and the, the, certainly when we're dealing with very <coughs> with severe difficulties, one of the uh, most resilient things you can do is actually, you know, call for help. So calling for help, in fact, is a, a very resilient uh, process. And, uh, and then, yeah, uh, and, and all the other things that we've been talking about would still apply. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to finish with um, asking each one of you to give us a takeaway, a take-home message. Um, uh, that could summarise uh, what you'd like people to, to remember from the session. So, Divya. Um, sure. So, I'd just like to tell everyone, uh, DNA is not our destiny. Um, we can just start today by making very small changes, you know, changing certain lifestyle factors, sleep, you know, our diet, exercise, you know, building, improving our social networks, as we've heard. And what all this is going to do is we can, you know, essentially change the activity of our genes and this will have a very long lasting and a persistent impact on both our physical and our mental health. I'd like to build on that and say that the brain is about 40% untapped, it has amazing potential and it's actually really strong and resilient. 
I think Monique's demonstrated that today. I wish that for you because I believe all Australians deserve to be happy, healthy and strong. Um, I think the research is showing more and more that uh, resilience and, and well-being is tied in with a sense of connectedness but that source of connectedness can vary from person to person. So Ian's talked about the importance of sense of connectedness with humans. There's emerging research showing that some people it's really important to have a sense of connectedness with nature and plants. Uh, there's also research showing that people feel a sense of connectedness with animals. Uh, but also there's a large part of the population or the world uh, that uh, benefit from a sense of connectedness with God or higher um, presence. And we're all different and uh, um, important to be aware of that and to appreciate that. So you know, my experience is that cat lover, lovers just can't understand how anybody could have a sense of connectedness with a dog. Um, but, and then introverts can't understand how people can have a sense of connectedness with a wide group of people. Uh, but then there's also spirituality, which is on a continuum as well. And there's, for some people, they just can't understand how can you have a sense of connectedness with something you can't see. But on the other uh, end of that spectrum, there's people who that's the most important thing in their life. Um, and as we go around trying to explore that in terms of uh, what is best in terms of sense of connectedness, I think that would help us give a sense of um, uh, resilience. And that changes in uh, people's lives. It's not constant. Um, for example, in terms of spirituality, as people get older, uh, they tend to uh, think more about spiritual issues. Uh, but I guess my take home message then is out of all that research, probably the area that's had most uh, evidence base is mindfulness. And so independent of whether or not you uh, uh, consider yourself a spiritual person, then uh, read about mindfulness and try to apply it, and that, that's something that's shown uh, a lot that, uh, that promotes resilience. Thank you. Going to Ian. <clears throat> Thank you, David. So um, I guess for me the take home message is that um, we can all be resilient and that we all have experienced moments where we have been resilient. Um, I think everybody in this audience, if you reflect, can think of a time in your own lives when you've been resilient. And important parts of that is to remind you of your strengths, remind yourself of your strengths, and to identify what those strengths might be. Maybe take some time to work out how to uh, manage your stress and keep calm in, in the face of stress. And, and then lastly, to make sure that you reach out and get the support that you need. And, 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 and if you don't, if the first source of support that you get doesn't help, keep trying until you get the support that you need. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you. I think COVID has really highlighted that um, we're not meant to do this life alone and we really need support networks and people around us. Um, so my takeaway take point would be to tap into the support networks that you do have in your life and invest in your relationships and spend time with people. Um, that you care about and ask for help if you need it. Um, you know, it's, it's a brave thing to ask for help. It's a resilient thing to ask for help. And there is so much help out there as well. Um, help can be in the form of informal help from friends, trusted friends and family, or it may be in the form of formal help um, through a mental health professional such as a psychologist. Um, and there's actually a really fantastic website um, called headtohealth.gov. It's a government website. Um, and you simply type in um, a couple of keywords of what you might be facing, for example, anxiety or depression. Um, and it brings up um, a lot of helpful evidence-based resources, um, such as mobile phone apps or um, you know, websites, things that might be able to um, be of assistance for you. So definitely reach out for help if you need to. And my brief one is, is to suggest that you imagine something that you could do today uh, which would help to lift your mood and give you a sense of achievement, work through that event in your mind and how you're going to prepare for it and how good that's going to be to do that particular thing. But I'd like to go to Monique for the last word. <laughs> okay. Um, my two main takeaways would be firstly, you're not alone. And the more that I've reached out and spoken to more people and gotten more involved in mental health spaces, the more I've realized just the depth of what individuals are faced with every day. And realizing that I'm not alone makes me feel like I am in charge of what comes next and that I'm capable of making it what I want it to be because I can see what other people have gone through and the way I look at them 
and see how much they have accomplished makes me hopeful for myself. And finally, find what works for you. Whether it is asking for help, whether that's going through a uh, phone line or reaching out to a psychologist, find the way that works for you. I know that I've asked um, a few doctors, like GPs, to help me find a psychologist that will fit me. So it's about finding a good connection and finding something that you can do each day, like we said, in terms of accomplishment, that will work for you. For me, it's staring at a black line in the water, and I don't recommend that to everybody because it will not help everybody out there. But whether it's a bit of sport or going out for a walk, um, doing a puzzle, just find something that allows you to connect to yourself and is sort of like a little moving meditation and just give yourself time every day to work at that. And you can't pour from an empty cup. So try to keep it full. Thank you. Um, Sarah already mentioned uh, Head to Health. Uh, we've got the link to that um, coming up on the website and some link to some other digital resources as well that you might find helpful. Um, and you'll find some specific ones around um, COVID-19 that are connected with that. So you can download those or get the link from our website. And, and we will uh, link that, we will email those to you as well. And if this discussion has raised any issues for you, please uh, contact uh, Lifeline or Kids Helpline uh, or Beyond Blue. If you go to each of their websites, they have both um, online chat and phone uh, available. So thank you so much to Monique and to all of the panel members uh, today uh, for this session, which um, I've found really terrific. I hope you have as well. Thank you for attending it. Um, we hope you've enjoyed it and that you perhaps have taken something useful from it. Now, all the best to all of you in your own efforts to go beyond resilience, in fact, to having a life that's uh, rich with meaning and satisfaction. Thank you very much. Thank you.